tonight on CBC Vancouver News. Visitors will now be allowed for long-term care and assisted living facilities. Relief for families as visits with seniors and loved ones resume, but with guidelines. Also, travel industry is a dying. Restrictions on air travel may be easing, but travelers remain hesitant. And National security law clearly targets the protesters. Could China's new national security law trigger an exodus of people from Hong Kong? This is CBC Vancouver News. Good evening. BC is lifting its ban on visits to long-term care homes. The long-awaited announcement also includes new funding from the province to ensure in-person visits can be done safely. The CBC's Tanya Fletcher has more on the loosened measures and reaction from families who have been pleading for this for months. There have been many dark and anxious days, but today is a brighter day for us all. It's a day that's been a long time coming, four months, in fact, for residents and their families. The ban on visits has taken a toll on many, and that's not lost on BC's top doctor. This has been a difficult time for you, being separated from the ones you love. You have shown a resilience, determination, and courage despite this challenge. Visits are now allowed to resume at long-term care homes, but with the following conditions. There can be no current outbreak at the facility. Only one designated visitor per resident is allowed. Visits must be staggered and booked in advance. Each visitor has to bring and wear a face mask. Staff will screen each visitor when they arrive, and the visit has to be in a designated meeting area, either indoors or outdoors. I'm very relieved and... Um I think that what they've come up with is a good plan. Diane Montgomery has been waiting for this day ever since the pandemic hit. Her parents are in separate long-term care homes on the North Shore. Her mother's suite happens to be on the ground floor. I have seen her at the window. It's, it's not great. And other than a few Zoom chats, she hasn't seen her father since March. Virtual visits don't work very well for, with, for people with dementia. So it'll be very, very nice to see him and talk to him and and uh, tell them about my mom. She's long been lobbying the province to prioritize a visitation plan and says this one is overdue. The statistics tell us that most people in long-term care usually only last about 18 months. So we've just lost four months with our parents. The province is also spending $160 million so that every long-term care home in the province, both public and private, can hire three additional full-time staff members to oversee safety protocols. I think by and large it's a good day for BC seniors and their family members. The BC Care Providers Association penned a letter to Dr. Bonnie Henry a few weeks ago calling for three things. Additional staffing to make sure that the, the care of seniors is not uh, interrupted in any way. Some additional uh, rules and regulations about what constitutes a safe visit and as well um, some discussions around PPE and making sure that people are safe inside the care homes. We essentially got those things. Visits can begin again once each facility's reopening plans have been approved. Daniel Fletcher, CBC News, Vancouver. A former nurse has been suspended over allegations he didn't use personal protective equipment around care home patients. The nurse was working at the Lynn Valley Care Centre at the height of its outbreak. Kenneth Chan is accused of failing to properly put on or take off his PPE around patients with COVID-19. BC's first reported case of the disease was at the Lynn Valley Care Home. 20 elderly residents died during the outbreak at that facility. BC's nursing college is also investigating the allegations. Restrictions on some international air travel have been eased and airlines are no longer requiring physical distancing on planes. But as Eva Uguen Senge reports, travelers are still hesitant to book flights abroad. Travel industry is a dying. The COVID-19 pandemic has been devastating for the travel industry. Now, Canada's two biggest airlines are relaxing physical distancing requirements starting tomorrow, just when the European Union is again allowing Canadians to visit. But travel agents like Glenis Chen aren't optimistic this will help their business bounce back. The airline schedule is not really back to normal yet. And then cruise lines suspend the uh, sailings uh, until the end of the year. And uh, as a, everybody, a lot of people have no job at this point. So maybe financially had the problem. Officials in B.C. aren't convinced filling up plane seats is safe. 
We are concerned. Um, it is an environment that we know people spend a lot of time in close contact with each other. Um, there are measures in place on airlines, including the way the, the, uh, um, uh, the circulation of air happens. Um, certainly it is incredibly important to be wearing a mask, but we also uh, feel that uh, physical distancing is an important part of that as well. Transport Canada says its recommendation on passenger spacing on planes is not mandatory. Many travellers don't seem too worried. To be honest, there was only one seat between each person anyways, like in a three-seater, so I didn't feel like it was doing anything in the first place. With or without physical distancing, Chen isn't optimistic travel will bounce back anytime soon. On the other hand, if you have the social distancing between seat to seat, the airline cost to run out a flight will be increased. So that means we might expect the um, extra fare increase. Those who have been traveling domestically throughout the pandemic seem to feel more comfortable with the relaxed measures. Are you thinking about traveling back to Europe anytime soon? Uh, yes, yes, within the next month. In the next month? Yeah. Where, where, are you go, where would you go? Italy. Italy, that's where I'm from. I've actually thought about maybe going somewhere else for the second wave because I have pretty much lost my work, my employment for the time being. But with the requirement to self-isolate for 14 days upon the return to Canada, going abroad means making a big time and financial commitment. Eva Yuguen Senj, CBC News, Vancouver. And to the latest COVID-19 numbers now, there are 12 new cases in BC. And for the fourth straight day, there are no new deaths. So the province's total remains at 174. For the most part, the rest of the numbers are the same. There's just one fewer active case, so BC is down to 152. However, one long-term and acute care outbreak is over, so just five remain. There are 18 people still in hospital, and four are now in intensive care. Nearly 2,600 people have now fully recovered from the virus. A summer staple in the city has officially been cancelled. The Vancouver Canadians won't be playing this season. Challenges due to the pandemic proved to be too much for the league. People who purchase tickets can roll the value over to next year or request a refund. It's the first time since 1977 the Canadians won't be playing at Nat Bailey Stadium. Flood warnings are up for large parts of the B.C. central interior, and if more heavy rain moves in, rivers could rise to levels not seen in decades. And Dan Burt joins us now live with more. So, Dan, what are the areas that are affected? It's a large swath close to the upper Fraser River. That's where we'll start, and that could lead to some flooding down here. Take a look at this map from the B.C. River Forecast Centre. Those areas in red are under a flood warning. That includes in and around Prince George, the Quinell River at Quinell, and the Quinell River at Likely. The areas in orange are under a flood watch. That's the north and south Thompson Rivers and the Chilcotin River below Big Creek. The big areas in yellow have high stream flow advisories. The Peace Region to the north, the Middle Fraser below, the Thompson River near Spence's Bridge, and the South Thompson near Shoe Swap. Warm weather and rain have river levels rising, and we're expecting another storm. I'm going to let Brett explain that. But flooding is expected in areas close to these rivers, and it could be historic. Our current modeling is indicating the potential for, for flows to reach up to flows that we experienced in, in 1972, particularly in the upper Fraser uh, Basin and Prince George, as well as the Thompson River. And while this isn't uh, a certainty that we're going to see these flows, it's certainly the, the presence of that scenario and the, a risk of that scenario is really what's prompting uh, a lot of this early warning. Meanwhile, I'll take a look at this. This is the Fraser River at Hope. That red line you see in the upper right is what is forecast, the river level, the discharge, the amount of water rushing in the river, peaking between this Sunday and Monday. And it is forecast to be above the peak of 1972 when flooding caused millions of dollars in damage. Already, the city of Port Coquitlam is urging people to stay away from fast-flowing rivers, creeks, and riverbanks. And while BC normally does see higher river levels in May and June because of melting snow at higher elevations, the spring freshet, we call it, they want you to be very careful. We'll have the latest tonight at 11. Leanne, Mike? All right, thank you so much, Dan, for that. So let's check in now with meteorologist Brett Soderholm. So, Brett, as we've heard, some concerning forecasts there with uh, some stormy weather on the way in the central interior. What are we expecting? 
Yeah, absolutely. It is not uncommon, of course, to get rain here in BC, but the type of setup we're looking at is particularly concerning because it's going to be bringing rain from kind of the opposite direction of where you would think. Take a look at this map that I've prepared for you. Normally, when we think of rain coming to BC, it comes off from the Pacific Ocean, but this area of low pressure that you're seeing, indicated by that L over southern Alberta, this is the dominant weather story. It's going to be slow moving, and that means that as it is slowly progressing to the north and the west, it is going to be bringing a lot of heavy rain province-wide across BC for Canada Day and potentially even beyond. You can see that by Thursday it really hasn't moved all that much and much of the province in that time is going to be accumulating very significant rainfall totals. This is just again a rough estimate of what is possible here but you're going to notice that especially anywhere east of Highway 97 is particularly at risk so this does include toward Kamloops and Revelstoke but also most importantly toward the far north and east Fort Nelson and Dawson Creek there the potential could be for exceeding 80 80 millimeters of rain. Now, Environment Canada has already issued a rainfall warning for those areas indicated in green. That includes Dawson Creek and areas south of the Peace River for 75 millimeters of rain as possible. And here you can see in a special weather statement for pretty well everywhere else, once again, east of that Highway 97. So it's very important to uh, stay clear of those rivers. As we mentioned, a lot of heavy rain is definitely on the way. All right, Brett, thank you. Talk to you again in a little bit. RCMP in Pemberton are looking for anyone who may have been the victim of Roger Molinero, who's been charged with multiple counts related to historical child sexual assaults. Investigators are trying to confirm if the 50-year-old had alleged victims beyond the incidents for which he now faces charges. Molinero was arrested in April. Police have so far identified two victims. Anyone with information is asked to contact RCMP for Crime Stoppers. And for the first time, breweries and distilleries in Vancouver will be allowed to have patios. City councillors voted unanimously in favour of the initiative to help struggling businesses. It's part of the city's expedited patio program in response to COVID-19. Some good news for breweries and distilleries whose tasting rooms were simply too small to allow for safe physical distancing. There's a man who's been living in an empty shed outside of Surrey Church for the last three months. When church leaders found out they had a squatter, they thought they'd have to kick him out. But then, as Jesse Johnston reports, they got to know Gordon Petrie and everything changed. When Sunday services were closed during the pandemic, staff at Holy Cross Ukrainian Catholic Church spotted something strange on their surveillance cameras. Every day, a stranger would come onto their property and clean it up. At first, we were, you know, concerned. You know, we had a homeless man living in our shed. But once we had a few conversations with him, got to know him, I realized that he's really uh, a really good guy. That really good guy... Can't do nothing without tools. ...is Gordon Petrie. A 50-year-old bricklayer by trade who fell on hard times three years ago, ran into trouble with the law, and wound up on the street. In mid-March, he moved into the empty shed on church property. This uh, church has become a bit of a safe haven for me now, and the people that go here are awesome. It's my home. That shed's my house. It's everything I own. Petrie earns his keep as a groundskeeper, security guard, and handyman. So, Hitchin lets him stay. You know, we had lots of problems with theft, and we would find needles on the property. And once Gordon moved in, all of that went away. After a while, Petrie and Hitchin struck up a friendship. So Hitchin went to church leadership and asked them to fix up an old house on the property that's sat empty since the parish priest moved out years ago. We could have Gordon uh, look after our property and in exchange have him live in, in the, the house. But there's a problem. There's mold in the home. The bishop determined it's unsafe to live in, so the best thing to do for now is board it up and find another way to help Petrie. He's worried that I'm going to get sick being in the house because of the mold. Um, I just wish he could see where I am now. It's, it's a lot worse. Now it's cold. When Hitchin so first met Petrie, he was a squatter. The weather, then he became a caretaker, and now he's a friend with nowhere to go. The hope is there's someone out there with a big heart and a spare room who can help him out. 
Jesse Johnston, CBC News, Surrey. Okay, Gordon's a guy you want to keep around. Yeah, I think so. Hopefully that uh, that works out. Yeah, I hope Doing somebody. Some good work out there. Yeah, absolutely. I hope somebody helps him with that the black mold in there. Not so good. Okay, a reminder: you can watch this newscast live on the free CBC Gem app. And CBC Vancouver is also on Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram. You'll also find both of us on Instagram and Twitter. Canada is keeping our borders closed. Ottawa has extended the ban on foreign travelers, plus more quarantine measures. We'll have details coming up. And thanks for staying with us during our ad-free live stream tonight. Well, this evening we're introducing you to a very special Canadian woman. She used to perform for our troops back in the 1940s. But now she's got a bit of a different audience. Her neighbors, 97-year-old Dorothy Rose, will be serenading them this Canada Day. We met up with her before her big show. I'm Catholic, old Catholic. Okay. And the nuns, they used to have an awful time with me. I was always into trouble. They wouldn't put me in the choir because I was just moving around too much. I'm Dorothy Rose, and uh, and I love singing and dancing. I'm going to be 98 on July 29th. In 1939, the war broke out. I belonged to a dancing academy. We were asked to be, have us, the students, become a part of a variety show to entertain the armed forces. And I sang and danced for four years. And I I think it's, it's all in here, a lot of it because I've had, I've had things like cancer and I've had, I bro fell and broke a hip and a few years ago. And like I haven't been without challenges, but I'm determined not to give in. I can't give you anything but love. I think I'm, I'm not, I don't know if I'm talking to God or who, but I say, please let me do well. Because you could, there'd be times maybe you don't sound as good, but I like, because I want to please the people that are there. You'd be surprised at how, how people come up after and say, oh, you made the afternoon, it was so fun. You know, it makes me feel good. <laughs> we'll meet again, don't know where, don't know when, but I know game some sunny day Dorothy is goals I think we can all agree she's pretty fantastic oh but my goodness 97 was yeah that? turning 98 in July wow. she's Very so good. impressive still got it absolutely yep. all right stay with us uh, more headlines from across the country in just a matter of seconds backyard is burning is anywhere safe i'm adrian lamb the host of a new podcast world on fire join us on the front lines of wildfires burning around the world find it wherever you get your podcasts ottawa is once again extending an order banning most foreign travelers from entering canada Sweeping rule in place since March was set to expire tonight. As Ashley Burke reports, the federal government plans to extend its quarantine measures even further. Even though the economy is opening up, Canada remains closed. The government has extended an order prohibiting foreign nationals from other countries from entering Canada, with one major exception. 
U.S. citizens are still allowed to enter for essential reasons, including transporting medical goods and food, but not for tourism. The Prime Minister said yesterday Canada needs to remain vigilant. We need to continue to be careful even as we reopen so that we don't lose all the significant progress we've made uh, through some very difficult sacrifices by Canadians over the past months. This news that the travel ban will be extended comes on the same day the European Union announced it's opening its doors to tourists from 14 countries, including Canada. As of tomorrow, Canadian citizens can enter and freely travel around Europe in an attempt to boost tourism. The EU wants the deal reciprocated if possible, but CBC News has learned Canada will not be allowing EU citizens into Canada for at least another month. The federal government also extended its 14-day quarantine rules for Canadians or anyone else entering the country. That now lasts until August 31st. There is a $750,000 fine or six months imprisonment if you're caught by police breaking that rule. Ashley Burke, CBC News, Ottawa. As you heard Ashley say there, Europe is further easing its travel restrictions. Starting tomorrow, more tourists and non-essential travelers will be allowed. But only 14 non-EU countries are on the block's safe list. CBC's Renee Filipponi has more on why Canada made the cut, but other countries, including the U.S., did not. The European Council unveiled its finalized list today for countries it's opening travel up to. Canada is on that list of 14 along with Australia, New Zealand, Japan, South Korea, and more. The decision about who gets the OK was based on the infection rate in the country, whether there was good physical distancing measures in place, as well as other economic and social considerations. The United States, Brazil, and Russia were left off because of their high infection rates. China was also excluded despite its lower rate, and that's because one more guideline for inclusion is reciprocity. There is a ban in China for European travelers, so the borders won't open for Chinese nationals. But the EU says that reciprocity will be taken into account on a case-by-case -case basis, and countries like Canada and New Zealand are getting a pass, despite having their own rules preventing foreigners. Ottawa says despite the EU changes, Canadians are still being advised against all non-essential travel outside the country and the 14-day quarantine rule on return still stands. The Prime Minister of New Zealand has said the decision by the EU will not change its stance either. I do think it is dangerous to suggest that we open up our borders at this point in time. This pandemic globally is growing. The reason New Zealanders have the freedom we have and that we've been able to domestically open up our economy has been because we have kept our borders so tight. The European list of safe countries is an advisory, and it doesn't mean all of Europe is going to open up. Each country could, in the end, choose who they want to let in. While the EU would like to see a more coordinated approach, that hasn't been the case since the start of the pandemic. Some countries hit hard by COVID-19 may want to play it safe and put in their own rules, while others hungry for tourism revenue may open up their doors to a flood of vacation seekers. Renee Filipponi, CBC News, London. Well, despite Europe easing restrictions, traveling within Canada is getting harder. Air Canada announcing it's canceling 30 domestic routes and shutting down operations at eight airports. The cancelled routes originate in Saskatchewan, Ontario, Quebec and Atlantic Canada. Company executives say air travel is not likely to pick up in the near future because of government-imposed travel restrictions and border closures. The airline says it expects the industry's recovery to take at least three years. It says it'll consider other changes, including service suspensions, in the coming weeks. And a dire warning tonight from America's top infectious disease expert, Dr. Anthony Fauci says new coronavirus cases could more than double if Americans don't change their behavior. As CBC's Paul Hunter reports, about 40,000 people are getting sick every day in the U.S. Are we going to stand together? Even as COVID infections in the U.S. now surge, pressure to ease up on rules aimed at fighting the pandemic grows. All bills are due. Our rent is due. Our car notes are due. Texas, like other states that had been reopening businesses, is now seeing a COVID spike, setting another infection record today, and it's clamping down again. 
Florida's home to its own infection surge with fears this coming holiday weekend that crowds at those beaches staying open could supercharge the spread of the virus. We're going in the wrong direction. Dr. Anthony Fauci, lead scientist in America's battle against COVID, today on Capitol Hill with a sobering prediction about this country's rate of infections. We are now having 40 plus thousand new cases a day. I would not be surprised if we go up to 100,000 a day if this does not turn around. And so I am very concerned. It didn't have to be this way. In Delaware today, Joe Biden slammed the White House for its COVID response and what he called the president's historic mismanagement. Month after month, as other leaders in other countries took the necessary steps to get the virus under control, Donald Trump failed us. In return, the Trump campaign called Biden a fear mongerer, though at the same time, it canceled a planned rally by Trump this weekend in Alabama, citing COVID as medical experts effectively pleaded with Americans to wear a mask and especially to steer clear of crowds. There's going to be a lot of hurt if that does not stop. Fauci hinted at progress toward a vaccine, but he emphasized there are still no guarantees. And as those infections grow, said Fauci, the entire country is at risk. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Washington. A new flu virus found in pigs in China has become infectious to humans. Experts say there's no imminent threat, but the virus does have pandemic potential. The finding comes from research conducted into flu viruses found in pigs in China from 2011 to 2018. The discovery of a troubling variant of the H1N1 virus sparked more intense scrutiny. Pig farm workers showed elevated levels of the virus in their blood, triggering closer monitoring in human populations. Experts say people living in close proximity to pig farms, slaughterhouses, and some markets are at risk. Well, small businesses across the country are struggling to survive during COVID-19. But for people in the LGBTQ community, some closures mean the loss of their only safe spaces. Kayla Hounsell looks at the impact when bars that cater to that community have to shut their doors. This side, you want that gap? Today, Rouge Fatale is teaching. Usually during Pride Month, she's performing. But the pandemic has changed things and forced the closure of her main stage. It kills me because that was our home. That was our only place. It was our only safe place. Halifax's men's and Molly's closed in April. It was the city's only dedicated gay bar. Likewise, Fredericton's Boom nightclub closed last weekend. It's pretty profound and pretty important to, to make sure that everybody understands not just why it's a safe space. It's not that it has a lock or, or the windows are secure. Um, it's not a physical safety. It's an emotional safety space. Amour Love is the reigning boom queen. The pandemic means virtual only performances for now, but even when other establishments start welcoming audiences back, she says it won't be the same. I can almost guarantee that when I do go out to any other bar other than a gay bar, I will get looked at, talked about, or pointed at at least five to six times before I even take my coat off. In Regina, the LGBTQ social club is hanging on. The bills mounted and the bills kept growing. Q Nightclub is owned and operated by the community. A GoFundMe page to help with pandemic bills raised nearly $25,000 in two weeks. I've seen donations and messages from people from that haven't been here for 15 years that talk about how much this place meant to them when they were coming out. It terrifies me. Rouge Fatale says the importance of a club, especially for people who are just coming out, cannot be overstated. It's scary when you don't have a church, you know, and to some folks, this that was their haven. That was their place to go to be protected, to be safe, to know that they weren't going to be judged. For performers, it's also a loss of income, but they say they will persevere and look for ways to create new safe spaces. Kayla Hounsel, CBC News, Halifax. Navy divers are still trying to find a dozen people missing after a passenger ferry capsized on one of the most polluted rivers in Bangladesh. Local media are reporting at least 32 people died after the small river ferry collided with another ferry yesterday morning. The 12 people missing are feared dead. 
Workers were able to locate the down vessel attaching gear to a crane in order to bring it to the surface and drag it to a riverbank. The ferry sank in just 20 seconds after the collision. Beijing passes a sweeping new security law in Hong Kong, changing the future of the territory. What it means for residents and Canada's potential role. We'll break it down next. Terry Fox never wanted to be a hero. He just wanted to live a normal life. Cancer made that impossible, but Terry Fox refused to give in. He fought back with unusual courage and with a dramatic gesture that captured the hearts of Canadians. When Terry Fox lost his right leg to cancer in 1977, he was an unknown young man in Port Coquitlam, BC, just another victim of the dread disease. But something inside Terry Fox a stubbornness, a dogged determination, set him apart from all the others. He refused to think of himself as disabled. Terry Fox trained and pushed himself to the limit, as though driven by some inner force on a mission that even he couldn't comprehend. His inspiration came from what he saw in the cancer ward when his leg was amputated. Leaving it healthy like I was, knowing that there, these people are still there, there's people in a bed right now who, is not gonna, who might not make it, kids my age and younger and and you just can't leave something like that and try and forget it with four hundred dollars in pledges he ceremoniously dipped his leg in the harbor at st john's newfoundland on april 12 1980. his daily battle was an inspiration to everyone but perhaps most of all to a 10 year old boy who like terry had lost a leg to cancer i'm, I'm crying now because I, there's somebody here right now who is going through the same thing that i went through exact same thing and he's only 10 years old and I I had the most inspirational uh, day of my life today if Terry shed tears he also drew them from every quarter along with dollars to support his marathon of hope wherever he ran whether along lonely stretches of highway or through big cities the admiration grew for this remarkable young man by August 3rd, he'd reached the halfway point near Sudbury, Ontario, the whole nation urging him on. Then on September 1st, he was admitted to hospital in Thunder Bay, and the following day, the Marathon of Hope had to be postponed. The cancer had spread, and now I've got cancer in my lungs, and uh, we got to go home and, tr and try and do some more treatment. But, uh, All I can say is uh, if there's any way I can get out there again and finish it, I will. He returned to hospital in British Columbia to undergo chemotherapy treatment. The Governor General made a special trip to bestow the Companion of the Order of Canada on Terry, the youngest person ever to receive the country's highest civilian honor. Chemotherapy treatments continued, but then it was announced that the cancer had spread beyond Terry's lungs. By the end, his Marathon of Hope had collected more than $21 million to fight cancer, and his mission had moved an entire nation. His courage, daring, and determination captured the hearts and minds of people in a way that no one ever had. Some of the stories we're following tonight on CBC Vancouver News. I'm very pleased, and um, it, it would have been nice it would be a month ago, but um, at least it's happening. Visits at senior care homes and assisted living facilities are once again being permitted. Many BC families have been waiting for this news since visits were banned more than three months ago due to the pandemic. However, residents can only see one designated person at a time booked ahead in a designated location. The care homes must not have an active outbreak. NBC has recorded 12 new cases of COVID-19, but no new deaths. That brings our province's total to 2,916 confirmed cases and 174 people who have died. 
there are 152 current active cases. 18 of those people are in hospital, four of them in intensive care. The new numbers come as officials remind everyone to observe social distancing rules during Canada Day celebrations. The, the airline schedule is not really back to normal yet and then cruise lines suspend the uh, sailings uh, until the end of the year. Air travel restrictions might be easing in Europe and two major Canadian airlines have abandoned physical distancing in favour of packing their planes, but local travel operators say they are still suffering as travellers remain hesitant about booking vacations abroad. International outrage today as China passes a sweeping national security law seen as the biggest blow to date to Hong Kong's autonomy. The bill grants Chinese authorities broad powers to crack down on anti-government protests and a wide range of other actions against the state. Prominent Hong Kong activists have posted on Facebook saying they are now withdrawing from pro-democracy organizations, some fearing for their safety, while other observers are predicting a flow of people out of Hong Kong into Canada, owing to their close political ties. And joining us now is Davin Wong, Director of Policy Initiatives for Alliance Canada Hong Kong. He was the president of Hong Kong University Student Union and was involved in the massive protests there last year. Devin, uh, thanks for doing this uh, tonight. You, you came here to Vancouver during those protests, I understand, fearing for your life. You must be concerned. Uh, are you concerned about your friends and colleagues who are in Hong Kong now with this new law being passed by Beijing? Yes, certainly. The national security law clearly targets the protesters and um, dissenting opinions criticizing Beijing and also the Hong Kong government. So, um, especially with the new law introduced in Hong Kong, it does not only um, cover um, normal subversion that we understand, but also protests against the Hong Kong government would be regarded as subversion against the state power and become criminally, um, criminally liable under the new um, national security law. So definitely, I'm really worried about my friends and family in Hong Kong. And do you think it might prompt a, an exodus of people from Hong Kong, like what we saw in, in the run-up to the handover in 1997? Well, to be honest, I have been receiving questions and texts from my friends in Hong Kong about um, leaving Hong Kong or maybe even um, fleeing from Hong Kong to Canada. So um, I think it is fair to expect a, a certain kind of exodus from Hong Kong to other states. But I also um, think this kind of uh, this exodus may not be one way, but it may come gradually, progressively. And what should Canada be doing to help? Well, I think Canada should be more concerned about the national security law than they are actually doing because this the national security law does not only concerns about Hong Kong protesters, but anyone who has been criticizing or be critical about Beijing because um, this national security law kind of um, provides a self-claim extraterritorial jurisdiction for Beijing where even if you're not a resident of Hong Kong you can be criminally liable under this law and be convicted of the offense so there are actually three things ca the Canadian government can do first of all um, the Canadian government should challenge this kind of self-claim extraterritorial jurisdiction that um, the Beijing uh, is trying to do under this national security law. And second of all, um, Canada should be aligned with other democratic states against um, Beijing's aggression. And thirdly, Canada should really take a pro proactive role in supporting Hong Kong protesters, no matter um, providing refugee uh, shelters or um, refuge to Hong Kong protesters. These are three things that the Canadian government should do right now. Devin, thanks so much for doing this tonight. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Devin Wong is Director of Policy Initiatives for Alliance Canada, Hong Kong. Facebook has removed hundreds of ads considered extremist and violent, all connected to the Boogaloo movement. Its influence is growing in the U.S. and in Canada. That story next. There's a soggy-looking live shot from Whistler <laughs> Olympic Plaza tonight at uh, 6.38.
Rain there, a dull day for the most part here on the south coast. A little bit of sun poked through for a while. Canada Day looking soggy and cool though. We'll find out how soggy and how wet next from Brett. In December, an arrest was made that put Canada into the middle of a trade war between the United States and China. Ms. Mung, what do you have to say to the charges? I'm Stephen Quinn, the host of a new CBC Vancouver original podcast. This is Sanction, the arrest of a telecom giant. It's the complicated story of how and why Huawei CFO Meng Wanzhou was arrested. Download Sanction today at cbc.ca slash sanctioned or wherever you get your podcasts. My voice. Let's do another check on the weather and meteorologist Brett Soderholm joins us again. So Brett, tomorrow, Canada Day, nice little, uh, I guess, midday day off for everybody, but here, not so nice, hey? 
Yeah, it's not going to be in the sort of traditional sense of, you know, clear skies and warm temperatures. We might get away with a few sunny breaks, but do be prepared for a few showers throughout the day. And I want to start things off by showing you what it looks like right now, because a few showers did fall across the region, and we are looking at these kind of coming back into play once again. So you're going to notice that we're looking at rain coming down from the north, so from Squamish and down the Sea to Sky. This is potentially going to be our story here in Vancouver over the next couple of hours. But temperatures, for sure, is one of the things you'll notice. It's been a a lot cooler today. Now, Vancouver sitting at 19 degrees right now, but out into the valley, only 16. And you look at Hope, 14 degrees. These temperatures are more reminiscent of March and April. Now, if you look at what we're going to be dealing with over the next couple of hours, a few sunny breaks as we're seeing right now. These are kind of a nice little surprise, but over the overnight period and through much of tomorrow morning, the risk is there for a few showers. It's not going to be a non-stop rain, but it's probably going to be more cloudy than anything else. And temperatures tomorrow afternoon are going to be just a little bit below seasonal. So here's the sort of timing. What you're going to notice, first of all, Vancouver Island likely remaining dry throughout this entire time, but m Wednesday morning you're going to see a few showers across the lower mainland, but definitely higher confidence as we travel farther east into the Fraser Valley. So again, not an all-day rain here, but there is going to be enough that bears worth mentioning. So if we look at the overall rainfall accumulations here, this pales in comparison to what other parts of BC are going to be getting, but we should be prepared for anywhere between two to five millimeters for almost everyone. Again, areas at slightly higher elevation elevation such as Maple Ridge that could be closer to about 10 maybe 15 millimeters but for Canada Day temperatures look at this like Kelowna only 14 degrees to start off July a normal temperature would be 25 degrees so we are looking at very cold air pushing in all across southern BC and even here in Vancouver a few degrees below seasonal but as a way to potentially change things up a little bit we're going to get through our unsettled conditions midweek so that means Wednesday and Thursday are going to be expecting a few showers but as we look ahead already to the weekend Friday Saturday Saturday and Sunday, there's definitely a lot of sunshine in the forecast and temperatures as well are going to go right back to seasonal. Now, if you've been following along while I've been out here on my balcony, you may have been a little bit concerned for my safety at points and a few people actually did reach out for me. It looks like there's no balcony <laughs> railing to my side, but I wanted to take the time to dispel this because if you look out over here, there oh, is a railing. Oh. It just so happens that my body happens to be perfectly <laughs> centered over it. So if you've ever been concerned, if you've been distracted, I apologize but that's the way that it goes and rest assured I'm safe the entire time. Oh boy, well those of us with the uh, fear of heights thank you greatly for that uh, explanation up there on the 26th floor. <laughs> Thanks Brett. Well social media giant Facebook removed hundreds of accounts, groups and pages today linked to Boogaloo, a radical ideology considered extremist and violent by U.S. authorities. But as Thomas Degla shows us, the fringe movement may be gaining traction here at home. And you will know my name is the law. Floral shirts and guns, two signatures of the so-called Boogaloo Boys. We just do a little yoink, and then we pull this out. Organized online, the movement mostly stayed out of sight until supporters started showing up heavily armed at U.S. anti-lockdown protests and Black Lives Matter demonstrations. They stand for gun rights and keep preparing for an anti-government uprising. It's really easy to look at somebody in a Hawaiian shirt and think, this is silly, this is not really a threat. They are attempting to bring about a civil war. This is not funny. Now, CBC News has found Boogaloo support is spreading into Canada with two Facebook groups and hundreds of members. This one taken down after CBC brought it to Facebook's attention. A user in another group sharing the image of a rifle with a grenade launcher dubbed a gun designed for ending the Canadian menace. The fear is that they now take uh, a page from the book of, of their American counterparts. The administrator of the Facebook group tells CBC he runs the page for the memes and humor. But consider, after two officers were killed in California, Authorities say they found this Boogaloo patch belonging to the alleged shooter. In Nevada, three supporters were arrested, accused of planning a firebomb attack. Governments should be concerned uh, because, you know, these days there, there's, you know, people need very little to do a whole lot of damage. Members of those Canadian groups appeared especially enraged when the government further restricted gun ownership. For now, they haven't moved to any real-world violence here, but online threats don't always remain virtual. Thomas Dagg, CBC News, Toronto.
An Edmonton man is back in custody tonight after people spent nearly two weeks protesting his release on bail. Wade Steen is accused of sexually assaulting an eight-year-old and police alerted the public to his presence even though he hasn't been convicted. Rafi Bujakanian has the result. Soaking up, sitting in your bathtub, cowarding like the coward you are. For nearly two weeks, Zach Gladu has been among the protesters upset over Wade Steen's release. Justice system has failed us way too many times. Steen was arrested, then released on bail after he was charged with kidnapping and sexually assaulting an eight-year-old girl. He'd been staying in the neighborhood where the alleged crime occurred. If he was in a hotel room where it wasn't in the same area, I don't think there would be an issue. Their viewpoint gained traction on social media, and they claimed support from beyond Canada's borders. Today, a judge revoked the bail application. Steen's lawyer says his client is relieved to return to custody. I ask that uh, the protesters essentially be dispersed. I understand that hasn't occurred. And they made themselves heard the moment Steen was escorted off the premises. Neighbors relieved too. You think your community is safe. You never believe it's going to happen to you until it does. And when it does, um, it hits you like a rock. Go! But police experts worry today's events could be setting a dangerous precedent. What struck me is the, what, what I see as, as the emboldening of vigilantism. And I, I think a lot of this is uh, the result of the social media and how quickly stories are spread. One of the foundations in, in Canadian uh, justice system is the fact that someone is presumed innocent until proven guilty. Late tonight, the family of Steen's alleged victim expressed relief and gratitude, saying it looks forward to a quieter neighborhood while it waits for future court proceedings. Rafi Bujikani on CBC News, Edmonton. Our comedy legend and television pioneer Carl Reiner has died at the age of 98. Coming up, we look back at his life and his legacy.
I'm CBC journalist Will Fundal, and I'm non-binary. But what exactly does that mean? We'll answer some of the gender questions you always wanted to ask in our new podcast, They and Us. Listen now. Well, music concerts are, of course, normally a key part of summer, but the pandemic means this year has been anything but normal. And that means many musicians are losing their income. Deanna Sumanak Johnson shows us now some of the creative ways they're getting back to work. Saskatoon knows everybody doing on a Saturday night. He usually performs inside arenas, but now Brett Kissel is bringing the party to the parking lot. This is the way we can bring music back, but keep everybody safe while still bringing everybody together, while still keeping everybody apart. This can work. As Kissel's band members play behind plexiglass shields, fans have to stay inside or stick close to their vehicles. I feel pretty safe. The spacing's good. The setup's amazing. Oh, we were kind of tired of sitting around the house and wanted to get out. Ottawa's Blues Fest is also shifting gears into a drive-in concert series. It's one way musicians are trying to get back to work after losing billions due to COVID-19 cancellations. So it is it is absolutely disastrous. People know that it's, it's going to come back someday, but it's going to be a very gradual return. It's going to be a much smaller business. Another strategy some music venues and bands are considering, so-called hybrid shows. Toronto's newly renovated El Macombo, equipped with high-end control rooms for streaming, is about to start hosting musicians on its famous stage. For now, without audiences. But down the line, that could change. We're, we're very hopeful that um, as, th as, th as the, the grip starts to loosen um, with social gatherings, that we'll be able to do a combination of having um, an audience here, a small audience, and stream the show uh, at the same time. For his part, Brett Kissel admits that drive-ins don't give him that direct connection to his fans. I will do my part to give more energy than I've ever given before because I can't reach you. I can't touch you. But until it's safer to get closer, this may be the next best thing. I want to hear everybody honk your horns for me right now. Come on. Deanna Sumanak Johnson, CBC News, Toronto. That seems fun, like a tailgate party. Well, right, yeah, they, and, and it works. A lot of space, and uh, we've got to make it, uh, make it work somehow. New normal. There you go. All right, Carl Reiner, a pioneer from the golden age of television, has died at the age of 98. As Eli Glasner reports, he's being remembered for creating the Dick Van Dyke Show and a decades-long friendship with Mel Brooks. Carl Reiner's talent was to make the people around him funnier. He made his mark on Sid Caesar's variety show as a straight man with a serious funny bone. That's not spaghetti, sir. That's spaghetti. <laughs> his time with Caesar became the basis of his creation, the Dick Van Dyke Show, where he played the blowhard boss. Alan, if you're going to have lunch and get to that meeting, you better get going. Shut up, Mel. <laughs> what are you doing to my chair? But it was another Mel who changed his career. Brooks was an up-and-coming comedian. One day, Reiner fed him a question that would inspire a hit record. Here is a man who was actually at the scene of the crucifixion 2,000 years ago. Isn't that true, sir? And first words out of Mel was, oh, boy. Yeah, oh, boy, it was terrible. Do you know Jesus? He says, yeah, it came in the store. And even though they've rehearsed this act and they've polished it, there are moments where Brooks starts to lean in a direction and, Car and Reiner sees it and goes with it. Yeah. And you can feel the joy. <laughs> Later, Reiner moved behind the scenes, harnessing the manic talents of Steve Martin in a series of successful films. More recently, Reiner had a recurring role in the Ocean's Eleven heist movies. So you're going to tell me? Or should I just say no and get it over with? Their boss. Comedian Sean Collins says Reiner comes from a generation that so put the laughs Reiner first. It never was about, oh, how smart that Carl Reiner is. He's, a, he's so insightful. I don't think he ever worried about that. And I believe that the, it takes someone incredibly intelligent to be that stupid, to do <laughs> that kind of stupid silliness and own it, you know? Even in their 90s, the silliness between Mel Brooks and Reiner continued. They met nightly to eat, watch movies, and kibitz. It was just last Sunday Reiner's manager shared a photo of the always outspoken Reiner with his daughter and Mel. Today, Brooks echoed the sentiments of many of Reiner's friends, calling him a giant who will be greatly missed. Eli Glasner, CBC News, Toronto.
98. Mm -hmm. Pretty great. So, so funny. Uh, Steve Martin, very uh, vocal on social media today, said that basically Carl Reiner uh, shaped his entire, entire career. Yeah, what a legend, hey? I remember him in Ocean's Eleven. Yeah, yeah exactly. he's great in that And song. father of, uh, of Rob Reiner in, mm -hmm. himself, a fantastic uh, yeah. uh, producer, director, and actor as well. What a life. Yeah. All right, just a reminder, you can always find this newscast online, cbc.ca slash bc. Our next local news is with Dan Burt at 11 o'clock after the National. Good night. Happy Canada Day. Happy Canada Day.